Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Ian McNeely, Associate Professor of History at the University of Oregon. McNeely is the author, with Lisa Wolverton, of Reinventing Knowledge from Alexandria to the Internet. The book was published by Norton in 2008. It explores the key institutions that have shaped and channeled knowledge in the West from the classical period to the present. A former junior fellow of the Harvard Society of Fellows with a PhD from the University of Michigan, McNeely has also written two books on German history. He teaches classes in world and comparative history as well as European history. Ian, welcome to UO Today. Thanks for having me. You know you are the first guest on our new set and you'll be the first guest of the new year mm -hmm. and we have a different intro so you are sending us off on a new chapter of this program. Wonderful to hear. <laughs> we're very glad because you work on things like transitions uh -huh. and evolution, yeah. so you're Big a very changes. fitting guest for us. Uh -huh. Yeah, in this book, which is a fabulous read and is very big and bold and broad in mm. its conception, um, is uh, I'll get back to the question for whom it was written. Uh -huh. But I'd like to start with how did you decide you were going to write a book that was so very broad in its conception? In some ways, I'd always wanted to write such a book. I mean, when, it, when I was a child, um, you know, growing up around computers, uh, the, the idea was already in the air well before the Internet itself had been uh, at least widely publicized and developed that, that computers were going to change everything. Um, and uh, that, in combination with my growing up in a university town, kind of made me sensitive mm -hmm. already to uh, the, way the, the ways knowledge is changing in our own times. Uh, and so, in many ways, I just had to wait 20 years to get tenure before <laughs> before I could fulfill that ambition. Uh, by that point, uh, I'd become a German historian. Uh, I'd, I'd wandered into that field by accident, still have roots in it, but uh, that exposed me to uh, the inception of the German Research University. Uh, and so, kind of putting together those bits of, uh, of, uh, of expertise and bits of experience um, it was really just a matter of uh, waiting to the right time to, to begin putting it together. I have to ask you which university town you grew up in. Uh, Gainesville, Florida. Uh -huh. uh, sort of the Eugene uh, of Florida on the opposite end of the country. Very, very similar in many ways though. Uh, the Eugene of the Atlantic Southeast. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Yeah. So for you the campus, the university was mm -hmm. a structure you grew up with. It was present in your consciousness from early on. Yeah, though I was kind of a townie. I, uh, my parents were affiliated with the university but not faculty members. So I always had the sense of being on the outside looking in. Uh, There's no way I could claim to be deprived or underprivileged but I did sense that all my friends who uh, uh, folks were professors somehow had access to a mystical knowledge that, uh, that I, I very much wanted to be a part of. Uh, and that perspective kind of carried over into the, into the book where I, I, I attempt at least to write about these institutions from the perspective of, a, of, a, of a, an interested um, outsider, uh, to look at them from the outside uh, going in instead of vice versa. I think that's one of the things that makes it very readable. You mm -hmm. don't write as a member of the University Academy, you write from someone who's surveying the university mm -hmm. as, as one of several institutions. Right. But I still wanted to go back to when you were finally able to sink your teeth into this mm -hmm. big topic. I think it goes back to the days when you and Lisa Wolverton were both at the Society of Fellows at Harvard, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Could you d explain this incubation period of the of the project? Yeah. No, I I just got my PhD in German history, written the dissertation, uh, faced turning into that uh, turning it into a book, applied for forty three different jobs. The only thing that uh, I got even in an interview for, was the Harvard Society of Fellows. Um, and at that time, that was uh, consisted of 24 people, young people in every different field, um, from Assyriology to quantum physics. Um, and, and in a way, the, the chance to break out of the PhD paradigm, out of the professional mold, to talk to people in these different fields, just um, A, it gave me an enthusiasm to take on something bigger and, and the confidence to do it. Uh, it gave me exposure to ideas in a whole range of different fields. Um, and also, more negatively, it kind of it broke me out of, of the professional paradigm and made me somewhat jaded about uh, the job market and the structure of academia. And again, I tried to parlay that into a more positive uh, approach toward, toward looking at the institution from the outside in. Uh, and that's where I met my wife, Lisa Wolverton. She uh, was the only other historian among the 24. Uh, I walked in first day and I said, 
I, I'm definitely not going to marry her <laughs> because we're going to have a terrible time getting jobs together. <laughs> but you know the way these things work, I, uh, we wound up together nonetheless, and uh, um, made it out here after some difficult job market searching. Uh, and uh, and by that point, the book had, had begun to incubate already, uh, building on our time at the Society of Fellows, and then and then it really took off when I when I got here and started teaching a course on the subject. I'm just curious to know, though, because mm. I've been at the university for forever, and I and I don't know what happens in the history of the Society of Fellows at Harvard. So, do you spend your day thinking big thoughts? Y to the extent that the structure of the place allows. I mean, the literally the only requirement you've got three years, you can do whatever you want, uh, and uh, you're encouraged, however, to attend three catered meals a week. Uh, the first of which is on a Monday night. Which includes, you know, all everything you might uh, 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 cynically expect from Harvard: the, the threadbare Oriental rugs, the wood paneling, the the dead Puritans' portraits on the walls, um, and copious amounts of alcohol. Uh, so you you know you wind up on a Monday night uh, with a lavish meal. You wake up Tuesday morning, try to do something with it. You get hit with another catered meal for lunch. You try to struggle through Wednesday and Thursday, and then on Friday you get another lunch. And if you can get some big thoughts thunk during that time, more <laughs> more power to you. <laughs> so uh, I, it's it's uh, it's I like to call it the musty attic at the very top of the ivory tower. And uh, uh, and don't get me wrong, it was it was a serious place. It was a, a, a great place to meet people. As I said, I was inspired by the people I met there to. Uh, so to, to bring together bits of knowledge that in many cases wound up in the book. Uh, but it's also got a very peculiar subculture, um, very typical of Harvard in some ways. One of the things that strikes me about this book is that it's a very bold book to undertake as a junior academic. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have second thoughts about um, writing something quite so broad uh, when y you were at a stage of your career where most of us are mm -hmm. focused on bringing out the first book based on the dissertation in mm -hmm. our small area of expertise? Did you find it daunting? Um, not really. I mean, I, in some ways, in retrospect, there, there <laughs> I, I look back and think, how how did I, you know, have the guts to do that? It's 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 full of broad claims, and 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 many of which I might even modify at this point. But um, no, I mean, I I I I realized early on that it was important to me and to my own development to get basically the first two books out of the way. Uh, not only as a means of jumping a hurdle before I got the freedom to do this, but also to, to train my mind to, to to plunge into. In my case, my dissertation uh, was you know very archivally rooted, very empirical, very uh, almost microscopically focused, um, and I I plunged so so deeply into those as a kind of mental calisthenics uh, that um, when it came time to apply those same skills to a much broader uh, subject matter, I, I felt that um, that training had stood me in good stead. So let's talk about the content of the book. Okay. It identifies institutions and moments of institutional change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you have any difficulty defining which institutions you were going to talk about and which moments of transformation? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was a matter of laying out uh, all all the you know sort of the big milestones in Western history. The history of Western civilization, so-called, uh, for about 2,300 years, and then picking uh, the, the key turning points. And, and the beauty of the University of Oregon quarter system was that when I first taught the course, that number simply had to be 10, because we've got 10 weeks in our quarter. Uh, and, uh, and then I whittled it down to six, just through a process of, of thinking about, well, what are the really, really big important changes? Uh, so I came up with the library, the monastery, the university, the Republic of Letters, the academic disciplines, and the laboratory. Um, and the, the first three, in some ways, are very easy. You've got library buildings in the ancient period, Alexandria the, the being the model. Greco-Roman civilization collapses. Uh, that mission is taken up in a different form by the religious scholars in the monastery. The monastery's preserved learning is as well known for hundreds of years before Europe revives, and you get these new scholarly guilds called universities. Uh, and so you just kind of continue that process. It gets a little trickier 
uh, as you move into the second half of the book to, to figure out where the key turning points are. Um, but I think teaching the course was what forced my mind into this radical condensation, this radical simplification um, that focuses on the big institutions and in some ways argues that those changes are more important than the big ideas, the Copernican Revolution or the Darwinian Revolution or any of these things that are, uh, don't get me wrong, huge intellectual breakthroughs, but unfold within institutions um, instead of causing new institutions to come about. So the institutions shape the production of knowledge yes. as well as allowing it to happen. Yeah. They, uh, essentially, they, they, they strike a bargain between intellectuals on the one hand and their patrons uh, on the other, whether rulers or governments or, or the citizenry itself. And it, they give people who are academically inclined uh, an ever-changing mission. If you worked in a, in a Greco-Roman library, you were working for an imperialist. You were working to establish the hegemony of Greek culture over the Mediterranean. Uh, and uh, as whatever noble and lofty thoughts you may think, uh, at some level you're serving their agenda. Uh, and so too for every other institution of knowledge. There's a, there's a bargain we strike, uh, and it's, it's by no means a Faustian one in every case, uh, but a bargain non nonetheless between uh, those who are privileged enough to seek knowledge and those who employ them to do so. I see what you mean that in, in terms of Western civilization and the, um, the heritage of Greco-Roman antiquity, the library to um, the monastery to the university mm -hmm. is a is a well documented and traced itinerary. Mm -hmm. But then tell tell me how you define the Republic of Letters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the Republic of Letters is you know you're you're right to suggest or imply that it's more amorphous than the university. You can't you can't isolate it. In fact, um, uh, many other s scholars and historians have begun to, to to argue that it's in many ways the early modern internet. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a correspondence network set up by scholars who uh, in many ways faced each other across ideological battle lines in the 16th century, Protestant versus Catholic. Uh, the, uh, the, the religious division of Europe, the religious wars of Europe had uh, torn the universities apart in some ways um, by rendering each one of them either Protestant or Catholic and then committed to that cause. So you get these kind of decentralized networks of people writing letters just trying to keep the lines of communication open. Uh, and that provo pro proves to be a forum where an entirely new discoveries and new knowledge can be created. Uh, so the voyages to the New World, uh, the Copernican Revolution, Galileo's uh, investigations, all get sort of filtered through these correspondences. Um, and then you get other things stirred in as well, the printing press, obviously huge technology at the time, um, museums. Uh, academies, they all kind of coalesce. And the, and the deeper argument is, I think that even though the university, the, the previous institution, has been around for some 800 years, it's not always been the leading institution of knowledge. Um, it comes and goes. It, it gets repurposed and reinvented itself. Uh, and sometimes the, the intellectual action has been entirely elsewhere. So where is it now? What's the state of the university at this beginning of the 21st century? Well, I, th I, I do fear we are you know, in, uh, you know, entering another one of those cycles where, if not uh, certainly destined to obsolescence, we are um, in the university seeing our privilege and our expertise and our ways of organizing and dividing knowledge uh, threatened, uh, undermined, uh, perhaps, however, also reinvented by uh, new societal imperatives. Um, and by that I mean that you know, I focus on German history, someone else focuses on uh, 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 polymer chemistry, someone else focuses on the philosophy of Kant. These are all valuable activities. I would hate to give them any of them up. But uh, increasingly our, our patrons, which include not only governments but our students who pay our tuition, uh, are demanding practical solutions to problems like climate change. Uh, uh, translating across cultures in the era of globalization. Um, and we would do well, I think, to respond to those in ways that, uh, that push our own comfort levels. You've identified for our decade, perhaps, or our generation, some of the forces that are pushing us to reinvent 
how we create knowledge and how we use it. Mm -hmm. But can you characterize what other sort of forces have caused the this evolution from one phase to the next in the trajectory that you trace in the book? Yeah, um, essentially it's massive, large-scale civilizational transformations. Uh, so uh, in, the, in the transition from the library to the monastery, it was the collapse of uh, Greco-Roman civilization, at least in the western part of the Mediterranean. Yeah, in the transition from the university to the Republic of Letters, it was um, uh, the religious polarization that tore apart Christendom and pitted Protestant against Catholic. Um, and the transition uh, uh, to uh, the research university, the academic disciplines, it's the growth of, of nation states and international competition. Um, and so, you know, when I when I take this approach, y y you know, you necessarily have to gravitate to the very biggest changes, and that at the same time makes me, uh, if not skeptical, at least a bit guarded when looking at today's world, where revolution is the every other word that trips off the tongue, and we assume that we naturally live in the most dramatic period in world history. Uh, on account of everything from the internet to global warming. Um, and while that may be, may be true, we need to hold, that, hold those changes up against the benchmark of, of past changes, which were arguably even larger. That's a useful reminder, actually, mm -hmm. and kind of a corrective, or at least a perspective-setting exercise. I think that is a little bit humbling and is good mm -hmm. for us, so yeah. I certainly endorse that one, mm -hmm. especially as a medievalist. You know, I'm well, trained in thinking about the pre-modern. Sure. Now, but one of the things that I wanted to get back to that I think we're still fighting out in mm -hmm. a way in an institutional set of conflicts is how the laboratory, the laboratory, uh -huh. changed the disciplines. Yeah. Can you talk about that, the tension between lab, discipline? Yeah, yeah. It's, that's in some ways the trickiest argument that, I, that I'm trying to make. Uh, number five is the disciplines. In other words, all the majors, all the ologies you find in a research university. And those, of course, include laboratory sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, et cetera. But what I see happening is the laboratory, in some ways, outgrowing the shell of the university, outgrowing its tutelage. Um, and so if you're a laboratory scientist today, you can work in a corporation as well as you can work in a university. Um, and not only that, uh, the sciences that are the, the, the intellectual practices that come under the, the guise of the laboratory don't even have to be recognized majors or ologies like physics or chemists. If you're a management consultant uh, working for McKinsey and you're going in and redesigning a factory, you're a social scientist whether you uh, have that academic credential or not. If you're an investment banker uh, designing a credit default swap, uh, you are using sophisticated academic methodologies, whether you reside in an economics department or not. You're experimenting, and we know that some experiments go horribly awry, credit default swaps being one of them. Uh, all this is a way of saying that um, the knowledge is being increasingly located in experimental settings that are partly within, partly outside of the universities. And in many ways, the most dynamic locales for that kind of experimentation are happening in corporations and biotech startups and uh, internet uh, search engine companies and investment banks even uh, in non-governmental organizations. And I think that's where uh, a lot of the ferment for institutional change will come from in the future as well. So all of those things you just mentioned mm -hmm. are part of what you would call the laboratory. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a counterintuitive uh, way of looking at things. It's not what you think of when you think of laboratories, you usually think of, you know, uh, folks in white coats and safety goggles. And, um, you know, the liberty I take with that term comes from the fact that every other institution has so many different guises and incarnations throughout history that um, that's in some ways just continuing the pattern of the past. La institutions are very flexible, very scalable, very uh, 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 prone to modification like that. Is there anything in the the previous four shifts that, and even this fifth one, mm -hmm. that makes enough of a pattern that you can predict where we might be headed for the next big institutional shift? Um, the, the only pattern, which I would hate to see extended into the future, is that every other institution of knowledge is male-dominated. And every other one besides that has been open to women. The library, 
the university, the academic disciplines were, in their original inceptions at least, uh, male-dominated, uh, agonistic, you know, kind of preening male peacocks battling for, uh, for ascendancy in a, in a medieval university lecture. The monastery, the Republic of Letters, and even the laboratory, think of Marie Curie, uh, for example, have been, if not welcoming to women, at least tolerant of them. So by a logical extension, we're, we're due for another sexist revamping <laughs> for men only. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, uh, so the patterns, uh, I think, you know, one thing all historians are, are uh, we have it drummed into us never to assume that the patterns of the past repeat themselves in the future. Uh, there's no automatic cycle going on. If I do think an, uh, an entirely new institution that will emerge, I think it has to do with environmental degradation and ecological collapse. Um, we're uh, the laboratory, people in laboratories are racing to create green energy and reduce our carbon footprint and, uh, and promote all the benefits of globalization while reducing their uh, adverse consequences. But I suspect that whether it takes 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years, we're going to eventually be looking at some kind of major lifestyle changes. Uh, that, um, that, uh, that s all the best science in the world, all the best management in the world are not going to help us with. And it's learning how to live a different life uh, that maybe will take us back to the monastery where uh, hopefully it won't get that bad <laughs> where you're facing a civilizational collapse, but that you're attending to, your, to the cultivation of the self and, and of ethical relationships with other human beings. Uh, in a way that we can't even imagine now, but we can say might very well be necessary in the future. Something that struck me in reading your book is that it is indeed very readable. It reads mm -hmm. quickly. It reads with great enjoyment. It was published by Norton, mm -hmm. um, a popular press, very respectable things, but mm -hmm. meant for a general audience. Yeah. For whom did you write this book? My college roommate. Uh, he's the man I had in mind, um, uh, also a history major, went off uh, uh, to a, a very good non-academic career. And uh, I wanted, I wanted to, to hit that sweet spot where you find the educated layperson, because uh, I know they're out there. I know book publishers find it increasingly hard to, to locate them. Uh, but again, I think given my own background coming from outside the academy, uh, I have a great uh, affinity and respect for anyone who's not professionally required to do so who expresses an interest in knowledge. And I wanted in some way to connect to that person. And, uh, and so, you know, thinking of a few people in my own, in my own background that, that I can imagine writing it to, that, that was my target audience. I don't know if I've reached them or not, but, uh, but that's the aim nonetheless. I think you must have, at mm. least to a large degree. It strikes me a bit as a stealth academic <laughs> book because yeah. it does have footnotes. Yeah, but they're yeah. actually end notes. Uh -huh. They're at the back of the book, yeah. and the footnote numbers are small and uh -huh. unobtrusive. Yeah. Uh, the book is nice to handle. Uh -huh. it's, a, it's an attractive paperback. Uh -huh. And the range of reviews you got was pretty startling. Mm -hmm. you, the book was reviewed by a great range of periodicals yeah. from science journals uh -huh. to electronic digital technologies journals to um, scholarly presses. So yeah. you, you did seem to get the whole spectrum. Yeah. Were you happy with the reception you've had? Yeah, I mean, everyone wants more. Everyone wants to show up in the Times and whatnot. But I think, you know, once you get past the vanity uh, issue of, of not seeing your, your name on the, uh, in the New York Times book review, uh, you realize that, I mean, I got emails. I mean, one of the great things is, that, you know, now you can Google someone and send them an email having read their book. So I got emails from people you know, all over the place who just kind of stumbled upon it at the bookstore and were moved to uh, write notes of thanks. And in some ways, that's even more gratifying than to get a, a, a review from someone who's, who's obligated to do it for professional reasons. So um, really, the, you know, the, the nice thing has been um, uh, hearing from people I'd never even guessed were, were out there. Do you have another project? In the on the back burner even now. I, yeah, I mean, I've, I I've been groping around with certain things. It's hard, you know, once you've done a, a big one to know whether you should tack back to the small or get even bigger. But what the heck? <laughs> let's let's uh, let's think about it. Um, I you know I focus mainly on the Western traditions of knowledge in this book, with some attention to China, India, and Islam. 
Uh, and one of my objectives is to show that until about 1800, these other world traditions were just as viable, just as robust as, as Western uh, traditions. Um, but I didn't get a chance to develop that as much as I'd like. Uh, so I'm trying to find now some way uh, to give due attention to those traditions in a way that will also reduce it to manageable size, make it readable to the educated layperson, um, uh, make it publishable by Norton, satisfy all these other criteria, in other words. You had the advantage of a great co-author for mm -hmm, this indeed. book. Uh, you and Lisa obviously worked very well uh -huh. on this together. Uh -huh. Are you going to collaborate on any of the future work? I, I, I don't think so. I, you know, I think that, uh, you know, one's enough for, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, any, any, uh, any, uh, authorial partnership that is also a marriage, uh, has a lot of tensions and strains as a result. And we came out of it with flying colors, but, uh, I think it's back to our respective drawing boards after this. I suppose it's healthy to draw some yeah. boundaries <laughs> around the degree yeah. of collaboration. I guess my last question for you, Ian, is um, I was really intrigued and delighted to see that the two of you dedicated the book to your daughters. Yes. You have two young daughters. Uh -huh. How are you going to try to prepare those girls to be ethical, fully functional, engaged citizens of a very different mm -hmm. world by the time they're out of college? I think just, you know, paying attention to their education, uh, making sure they're getting what they need. They're learning Chinese now. We do that outside of school. And they love it. I mean, the, they get to draw the characters. And, you know, just, just teaching them that learning is fun um, uh, is, is the main part. And then hopefully that does inform their ethical uh, and their moral upbringing as well. I mean, that's what anyone who's involved in a university, I think, at some level believes. It's always a gamble with the children of academics, yeah, whether they yeah. choose to rebel or whether they yeah. choose we to. We don't want them to be <laughs> history professors. That's the one thing. Fair enough. Okay. Well, Ian, thanks for coming to talk to thanks us about it. Me. And I look forward to having another interview in the future to hear what the next one, Great. the next book is about. Great. We've been speaking with Ian McNeely, author of Reinventing Knowledge from Alexandria to the Internet and an associate professor of history at the University of Oregon. Thank you for watching and see you next time.